Welcome to Nine Cents. Nine Cents is a satanic perspective of our modern world, and I'm your host, Adam Campbell, being joined by the amazing Jesse. How are you, my dear? I'm doing wonderful. Wonderful. What about? You gonna do one more? No? no? Super, super duper. <laughs> it is November 3rd, and we've got a fantastic show for you this week. Um, well, let me give a brief rundown of what you can expect in the episode, so you can fast forward our inter- intro banter if you don't want to listen to it. The I Dream of Jesse segment makes a return. It makes sense because Jesse's joining me. Episode six, Conspiracy Theories. <laughs> In the Infernal Informant, textual relations. Couples who text too much aren't as in love as they want you to think. And brain can see in the dark. The brain can. But can your eyeballs? I don't know. And in the final segment, Old Nick Peep Show makes its return for episode two. And we're talking about the hot and horny Halloween issue that was just released. So look for that at the tail end of the show. Okay, so a little intro. You ready, Jesse? I am. What did you think of the Greater Magic episode? Loved it. Loved it. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. It takes a lot of planning to get these things put together and to make sure that you as a producer slash, you know, presenter to really be happy with it. And then to make sure that the guests are okay with it. And this one was months in the planning. And so I'm very, very pleased to hear that you liked it. Um, I've gotten a a handful of really solid feedback about it. And I've seen a a few, uh, few rants against it. But I kind of prefer that. I I like it when people don't like what I'm doing because it gives me, it, it keeps me even. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Um, but I, I it, it was definitely something I, I took a back seat in. I let Magister Nemo um, really field the questions, though, you know, in his own wonderful way. And I think he did an amazing job. And it, because of him... This episode really, I think, stood out from the other two. And it's going to be a challenge moving forward with these, I think, in the coming years. And how to make each one distinctly different um, and worthwhile, I think. I, I, I would like to think that the first three are distinct and worthwhile. And I'm hoping that I can continue to pull that off. But I guess we're going to have to wait until next year to see if I fall on my face or not. I, I would say even if you end up doing something like one of the first three again, the content will be different. So I wouldn't worry about it. You know, I mean, if, it, if you if you even have Magister Nemo back for like the sixth one you do or whatever, yeah. it's going to be completely different content. So I really wouldn't worry about, you know, trying to do something completely different next year. Good just, point. Just, just make it good. And you always do. Yeah. So, you know, oh, fret not. You. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, and I've been talking about this for, again, I think since I started working on this project in June or July or something, um, I was approached uh, by now Reverend Anthony um, Magist, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, Megas Gilmore about sort of giving a new facelift. And they, they at- invited me onto the team to do this, to give a new facelift to churchofsatan.com. I was incredibly excited to be brought into this and it took months to come up with an accepted design and then to start building it and to start, uh, I literally had to recreate every single page and reformat all of the content so that it could sort of be universally adopted in this new uh, skin, we'll call it. Um, So between the three of us, it, it was a labor of love, and we truly hope that everyone loves it, um, or at least tolerates it. Uh, do you have any opinions about this, honestly? Have you seen it? I This is the first I'm hearing of it. Oh my gosh! Did you mention you were doing this before? Did I miss that? I Sneaky. I, I, I didn't come didn't out and say it, I just said I was working on a project. But what you memo. should do while I'm talking is go over to churchofsatan.com, clickety-clack, and like look at it because it's dramatically different than what it looked like before. Um, and it is something that it's months in the making and uh, we're hoping it's going to last for a while. And there's there's things that we're going to be updating and we're going to be evolving with it. And it's in a format where that's going to be easier to do. So um, very, very excited for that. But yeah, we took uh, it and, and there was a, a, a news 
release about it on the uh, COS news feed, and there it, it was featured in um, Old Nick Magazine, this month, latest quarter's episode. It had a little blurb on it, which is exciting. Um, but yeah, if if others out there have not gone and looked, and there's no reason, I, I would imagine, if you've already explored the, the, the content, there's no reason to go back every day or every week to go look at it. And so you wouldn't know. Just by the course of your life, you're busy. Well, go look at it. If I was Let following the news feed, I would have known. So that's shame oh, on not. me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a rule. Everyone must follow the news feed. Uh, no, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, you everyone has a focus, and hopefully, it's your own life and not a website. <laughs> hopefully. No, this looks um, good. This looks really good. Cool. Well, I, I hope you get a chance to explore it. There's a lot to it. And everyone who hasn't been uh, uh, over there in a while, definitely go check it out. There's there's new content and there's a lot of existing content that um, it was sort of hidden. And we've uh, together presented it in a much easier to navigate, more logical way, I hope, so that you can find all of the content. And there's, I mean, just to kind of put it out there, um, Megas Gilmore put out some new music for free on it that he composed. So if you've been aware of his uh, Threnody for Humanity CD, which was released ah, years ago, I don't know when, um, which is still available on Amazon.com, he actually has free music on the website, which if you haven't explored, you should, because it's fantastic. Uh, there's a lot of content, a lot of essays with a lot of different people contributing. And one thing that you may not have noticed um, in past, uh, we'll say, versions of the website, there wasn't a whole lot of photos, but now there's infinitely more. And it's linked to members' YouTube clips and presentations and snippets from other COS or satanic-centric content uh, from YouTube. So you can get a real healthy dose of media and uh, content, like, like the written word on the website now, which you could never do in the past. So definitely everyone out there, if you are a Satanist, check it out. Uh, one of our uh, ideas here is to uh, study, not worship, and this is a perfect avenue for that. And it's a free one, which you should take advantage. Um, all right, and then... Uh, a little bit of personal news here, which I'm very excited for, and I was uh, blown away, away by, um, truly, I was elevated to Reverend, which... Awesome! Yeah, for me, is fucking, it's just incredibly <laughs> odd. I mean, when I was told, I was a little awestruck, um, because it, it means that you, as an individual, are seen... Uh, as valuable as as someone who is of worth and for those of you maybe like me who has a bit of a self-image issue that can be hard to take and so it's really really exciting when you're recognized by your peers and those who you look up to um, to be seen uh, of worth and so I obviously accepted the elevation uh, happily and I will do my damnedest to be honest and uh, responsible about my presentation in Satanism and continue in uh, the trail that I've been blazing with Nine Cents. Uh, so thank you to the hierarchy for that. I truly appreciate it. Hail Reverend Campbell. <laughs> Just want to be the first to say that. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so I I was watching, uh, obviously Halloween just happened, people. I hope you had a fantastic one. I did. Did you, Jesse? Did you do anything for Halloween? Uh, yeah, actually, I, start, I woke, I woke up uh, pre-dawn and uh, cursed somebody before the sun even came up. It was it was a good start. <laughs> really? <of the> day. <laughs> yeah. I usually like to start with coffee, but all right. No, no, I, I cursed somebody first and then went down and had a Reese's peanut butter cup and a cup of coffee. So it was a great start to the day. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I, I had a wonderful day too. I. I I'm lucky that I get to live vicariously through my two children. Um, and Halloween was always this wonderful time growing up where you get to either escape your parents or at least blend in with the other riffraff of children and 
explore the streets at night. You know, I mean, it's that's sort of this, the thing you did with your friends at a, a, a sleepover is you would go crawl the streets in the middle of the night. It's just like this dangerous kind of independent thing you did as a kid that you could never have done otherwise. Uh, Halloween was an excuse to do it without getting in trouble or the potential of getting in trouble. Um, and so seeing that through my kids' eyes is amazing. I mean, truly just amazing. And I loved going through it. We And here's something that I've, I've noticed I'm sort of deviating from my notes here. I noticed that uh, the number of trick-or-treaters is plummeting dramatically um, where I live. It, and I, I blame Mormons personally, but there's this surge of what they call trunk or treating, which is a, air quotes, safe environment for children to trick-or-treat in, uh, which is typically in church parking lots. Uh, everyone, you know, sort of backs up in this gigantic circle with their trunks open and the kids just go in this circle of cars, getting candy from presumable, presumably church leaders or neighbors or that it like defeats the whole fucking sucks. person Halloween, in my opinion. That sucks. <laughs> which oh. means that fewer people are crawling the streets, which lowers the enjoyment. I mean, part, part of what's exciting is you run across so many different types of people and so many different costumes and you never really know, you know, there's always that fear. Oh, what ifs in the shadows and corners and with fewer people that, I don't know, in some way it's just cheapened a little bit. Um, so fuck all those people who are doing trunk or treat saying it up front. And then it just, you know, it made it so my kids didn't have as many houses to go to because with more people on their cars, they're not at home presenting candy uh so that was that was a little bit of a bummer but the why i brought this up now that i've digressed for fucking 20 minutes um the worst witch this movie that i've been watching since i was a kid probably because i have three older sisters but it stars feruza balk features uh a man that i love um <laughs> fuck and of course, for the life of me at this moment, I cannot think of his guy. Tim Curry. Name. Thank you. Yes. Tim Curry. Um, I've always loved him as an actor because he's a little overblown. He's a li- he, he, Well, he's truly theater. And so he has that theatrical approach to everything, not traditional, you know, like play it down acting. He's just theatrical in his presentations. Um, and <laughs> it's very 70s when you watch it. But I, I was sitting here... Uh, sipping on a beer, watching it. My daughter was with her friend uh, sitting right in front of the TV in front of me and they were like totally enjoying it and the songs and everything. It's a girly... It's sort of like Harry Potter but with for girls in the 70s. Um, and uh, I was like tapping my toe to the music and sort of humming under my breath. And my wife walks in and looks at me and busts out laughing <laughs> at me watching this little girl show, enjoying it and singing along with it. And I... <laughs> I can't see anything wrong. Like, I totally love this movie and she hates it with all of her being. And it's this rift in our marriage. (laughs) The worst witch is the rift in our marriage. She hates it so much. And I was hoping that you would have some insight on this if you've seen it. I have never seen it. (laughs) But I'm looking at it and I'm seeing family. I'm seeing musical. I'm thinking this is probably... And I actually, I like musicals. I like, like, you know, Fred Astaire, Gene Kelly kind of stuff. But this is just looking bad. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) This is looking really bad. Well, this is very not a musical. It's just, you know songs playing like theme songs and stuff like that and i guess that i guess it is kind of a musical because they do have a couple numbers but it's not like a footloose or a a grease or something like that um but uh and maybe i just like it because it reminds me of being a kid but i and i i've always had a thing for fruit of the bulk gotta say always even the monster that she's turned into um (laughs) But like it totally, I I love it. And Tim Curry has this amazing number, which is horrible, horrible. But he makes it tolerable and even slightly enjoyable. <laughs> this singing number about Halloween is <laughs> so funny. Well, I, he, he's in another movie that I, I've heard praised by other Satanists. And he plays the devil. And I'm trying to think of the name of it. Legend? Legend. I have tried twice Three times now to watch that. I cannot get more than 10 minutes, 20 minutes into it. And I just have really? to turn it off. It's just so terrible. It's 
is it is it is it Tom Cruise or is it the I cinematography don't... or it's either the acting or the script. I I don't know which, but wow. I I cannot bear it. It's it's just so bad. <laughs> and I mean, I can watch I could watch like Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, so it's not like bad is necessarily oh, yeah. bad, but <laughs> It, this I'm isn't surprised. this isn't trying to be bad. This is bad trying to be good. I'm completely shocked. I know. I, I, I a lot of people swear by that movie. I just I've never been able to even get to where Tim Curry comes into it. Maybe once he comes into it, it's a fantastic movie. I don't know, but I've not been able to get that far. Wow. I mean, he has a, a brief cameo at the very beginning, I think, to sort of set it up. There's a couple of versions of the show, though. Yeah. Um, and then. Yeah, he's like sort of from the halfway point on. He makes an amazing, amazing performance as the devil. Um, and it's partially the makeup. The visual aesthetic is obviously, you know, it's it's very satanic in its presentation. And it's very great. Um, but he, again, he has this theatrical flair when he acts. And he he gives this sort of Lord of Darkness, as it were, um, he gives it a, a, a tone that I don't think many actors could pull off where it doesn't just feel like it's this devilish bad guy. I mean, it, it feels like he's an actual person with flaws and, and, and hopes and desires that are just not met. Um, and that's why I really loved that performance is it didn't paint it as this ultimate bad guy sitting in a throne room sort of pulling people's strings like a puppet master. He very much was at the mercy of those around him at times, even though he had dramatic strength and, and power uh, just resonating about him. Uh, if you can fight through that beginning, I would <laughs> at least try to sit through it so you can catch that performance. Um, and then if you hate it, then, well, at least you gave it another shot. Yeah, maybe one of these days. <laughs> I'll tell you what. If you and your man ever make it over here, I'm locking the doors <laughs> and I'm barring the windows and I'm going to throw on legend. <laughs> and if I have to skip forward to parts, <laughs> just say, look at this scene, look at this. I'll do it. Oh, turn the sound off until he comes on, at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I don't think there there is a very like sort of super preteen girly princess running through the woods and fairy part of it. So and, and it's all like glitter and misty woods and stuff like that. So I I get that being kind of weird. Yeah, but it's like even even the Princess Bride was that, but it didn't take itself seriously being that. I think that's where this yeah, that's true. The, the problem with legend is it's just it's it's none of it's meant to be funny. It's all meant to actually be good. And when it isn't it's <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's terrible. It is. It all is. Right, well. Don't watch The Worst Witch <laughs> because you will hate it. Okay. And then you'll look down on me like, how could that dude like this? <laughs> so, um, unbelievable. I truly love it. There's, there's this fantastic part in this song when Tim Curry pulls out a fucking tambourine. And the words that happens when he pulls it out, he's all, has anybody seen my tambourine? <laughs> so fucking awesome. Oh, Okay, hold on. I gotta <laughs> take a deep breath. I love it so much. It's so funny. All right. Well, never mind. No one ever see that show, so they don't know anything about me again. Um, don't watch The Worst Witch or Legend, apparently. And how about instead we listen to I Dream of Jesse? Okay. Jesse. What do you want? Well, first, Jesse, I'd, I'd, I'd like you to address me as master. I, I am your master, after all. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes, master. That's better. Now, look, I've got guests coming over tonight, and I want you to entertain them. What, do I look like a belly dancer? Uh, I, I assume that was part... I mean, the outfit, it, it kind of suggests... You may be used to dance. Listen, the gin put me in the bottle. He forgot to add the preservatives. Now, the outfit may be wrinkle-free, but what in it ain't. You don't like it? Call the number on the bottle and complain.
I love a good conspiracy theory. And by good, I mean entertaining, not necessarily plausible. Tell me about Masonic symbols and national monuments. Tell me about satanic rites at Bohemian Grove. Tell me about everyone who benefited from the death of John F. Kennedy or the destruction of the World Trade Center. I eat it up. On the other hand, I also like to hear these same theories debunked in a series of dry fact checks and scientific explanations by the skeptics. Who do I come away believing? Nobody. The problem with conspiracy theorists is their need to believe their theories. You can't start out by telling me that the government is lying to me and that hidden forces are operating on secret plans behind closed doors and then tell me that you've got enough information to explain what's going on. Unless you're the grand poobah of the Illuminati with Oprah J. Rockefeller and Warren Buffett on speed dial, you're in no position to tell me what these individuals are up to. Now, not all conspiracy theorists arrogantly claim to know what's going on, but most do. Most take the attitude of trying to educate the benighted masses. In fact, maybe it would be more accurate to say that all conspiracy theorists fall into this group, but that there is a much wider group of conspiracy suspectors who just don't trust the government, the corporations, religious leaders, the media, or any other individual or organization with the power to do harm. I'm quite comfortable calling myself a conspiracy suspector. As such, it really annoys the hell out of me when a theorist tells me to wake up. Kind of makes me want to punch him in the face. Skeptics don't usually get my goat like that, but that doesn't make them any better. I'm calling them skeptics because that's what they call themselves, but I'm a little skeptical of the skeptics. An argument I've heard numerous times against conspiracies is that they can't happen because our government's too incompetent and someone will always talk. In light of all the information coming out about NSA spying, it would have been nice to hear at least one self-proclaimed skeptic come out and say, oh shit, I guess we got that wrong. Perhaps they're thinking to themselves, well, Snowden talked, so we were right. Conspiracies can't happen because someone always talks. Okay, fair enough. But look at how much our incompetent government accomplished before the enormity of this came out. And that's assuming the enormity of it has come out. Maybe it's all far worse than we know. Now, not all skeptics are immediately dismissive of conspiracy theories on the grounds that conspiracies can't possibly happen. Some skeptics do look at individual arguments and try to prove or disprove them. And here's where you've got to kind of step back and try to see the big picture. Conspiracy theorists, after telling us we're being kept in the dark and or lied to, claim that despite the lies and secrecies, they somehow have it all figured out, and thus they present us with their theories. Skeptics, looking for arguments to prove or disprove, take these theories and, surprise, surprise, find holes in them. With one or more elements disproven, the entire theory gets discredited, and the original suspicious event is just completely forgotten. Why, if I were the grand Pumbaa of the Illuminati, I'd be laughing all the way to the bank. Or maybe to the secret location where all the gold that's supposed to be in Fort Knox is hidden. Jesse Ventura, a prominent conspiracy theorist, has used the phrase, I'm just asking the question. Okay, that was a really bad impression, I know. I can't do impressions. Even if I could do impressions, I can't do male impressions. And even if I could do male impressions, I probably couldn't do Jesse Ventura. But still, I'm just asking the question. I think he's being a bit disingenuous when he says this. I think his questions are intended to lead to specific answers. But I do like the attitude of just asking a question. If we're being lied to and the facts are being hidden from us, asking questions seems a whole lot smarter than forming theories. Joe Nickel, a prominent skeptic, claims to go into each investigation with the attitude that what's being claimed might be true. I also think he's being a bit disingenuous, though I again like the attitude of saying... I don't know what the truth is, and that's why I'm investigating this. Nickel focuses on paranormal claims, not conspiracy theories, but it's his idea of open-mindedness that I respect. Now, all human beings with normal functioning brains have the ability to see patterns and sense agency. It's fun, and it's easy. We all also know how to look up facts, read expert testimony, and grab a list of common logical fallacies and check our own opinions against it. That's difficult, and it's tedious. And it's part of why I hold skeptics in higher regard than conspiracy theorists. They're doing a tougher job. But my respect for the effort and methodology of the skeptics doesn't mean I hang on their every word. Now, I'm not trying to pick on Jesse Ventura or Joe Nickel. I chose them as examples because I find them less annoying than most. 
But even if they each overcome the very human tendency to cling to a worldview and see everything through its lens, the market will still be pushing them to take sides. I mean, Ventura's audience doesn't want to read a bunch of questions. They want to know his theories. Nichols' audience doesn't want to read what possibilities he was willing to consider. They want to read how he debunked something. I believe both these guys believe in what they're doing, but they're also getting paid to do it. Now I, on the other hand, I'm not getting paid to tell you anything. And therefore, you should trust me. Trust me. George W. Bush allowed the World Trade Center attack to happen. Bill Gates is a modern-day eugenicist forcing sterilization on third-world countries via tainted vaccinations and AIDS medications, and the Illuminati are alive and well. Make no mistake, they never really went away. Wake up, people! But don't worry about politics. Our government is way too incompetent to be making contingency plans for any large-scale social unrest. And there's no higher power limiting who our choices for president are. And just because we put information in digital format doesn't mean anybody's going to be using technology to capture, store, and index it for later analysis. Nobody buys that old knowledge is power canard anymore. That's just crazy talk. Besides, anything untoward that our government was doing would have been published on WikiLeaks or in The Guardian by now. So if you haven't read it there, it can't possibly be going on. Relax. Trust me. I like listening to skeptics plod through a theory logically and critically. It reminds me how to think. And common sense has way too many inherent pitfalls to just assume your way of thinking is good enough. There are tools to better thinking that can be studied and practiced. But I also like to be inspired by conspiracy theories. If you can weave Edward Bernays, the Federal Reserve, and GMOs into a single tale, you've got me hooked. I don't care if it's true. I don't expect it to be true. Entertain me with your best batshit crazy ideas, and afterwards, the questions you raised will be in my head to ponder. The skeptics may show us how to think, but it's the conspiracy theorists that hint at things we might want to be thinking about. Here we go. Hey, what's going on first? Uh, in front of me. You know what's wrong. You out there. Okay, this is from Time, Health, and Family, and October 31st. Textual relations. Couples who text too much aren't as in love as they want you to think. Strong relationships are built on communication, or so the experts say. So, digi so digital relationships, fueled by a torrent of texts, should be ironclad, right? Maybe not. About 82% of young adults say that they text their romantic part partner multiple times a day, but all that connectivity, it seems, doesn't always translate to greater relationship bliss. A new study published in the Journal of Couples and Relationship Therapy surveyed 276 men and women around age 22 in meaningful relationships. Casual daters were excluded. Among the participants, 38% were in a serious relationship, 46% were engaged, and 16% were married. All said, eh, pop-up just came up. Hang one second. <laughs> All said they used text to communicate with their loved ones, but it wasn't the volume of messages, but their content that affected the quality of relationships. In general, those who sent loving messages also reported higher satisfaction with the relationship, so texting was an effective way to enhance romance. When it came to the number of messages, however, men who texted more often in general reported lower relationship quality than those who didn't ping their significant others as frequently. The researchers can only speculate about why, but suspect that as men disconnect from a relationship or consider a breakup, they replace face-to-face -face interactions with the less intimate communication in the form of increased texting. Women who texted more often, on the other hand, reported higher quality of connections with their mates than those who m messaged more sparingly. Women tended to take the smartphone keyboards to, sorry, women tended to take to their smartphone keyboards to apologize, work out their differences, and make decisions. In other words, when their relationship was in trouble. As their connection with their loved one deteriorated, women attempted to make up or resolve their differences via text, which the scientists believe is the online version of the need to talk things out. Researchers say that such understanding about the role of texting plays in the way lovers communicate could lead to greater appreciation for when such missives help and when they don't. For now, texting seems to be the best for the first blush of a new romance and better left alone when deeper conflicts arise. So uh, can I ask, you uh, 
You and your men text a lot? Uh, we're pretty much Luddites, and I don't even have a phone <laughs> capable of texting. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, you're the perfect person to talk about with this. Then. Well, I, I actually, I read this and I immediately thought to myself, there is some poor sod out there whose girlfriend has been nagging him. How come you never text me? Don't you? I send you 50 <laughs> texts a day saying I love you. You never. And so he's like, Jesus H. Christ, sets himself an alarm to send her a text every goddamn hour. And then she reads this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I really like that because there was that little bit I'm trying to scan for it really quick where it said like um, men – said that like they didn't have a favorable opinion about their relationship uh the more texting that they got from their girl that's why <laughs> you won't leave the fuck alone i gotta say one one part of uh being uh, you know when i was first dating my wife um you need space like you have to be able to breathe for 10 seconds and if we had cell phones in that time and if I was constantly getting texts every two seconds. I love you. I love it, w, w. I would go crazy. Like I would break my phone and then break up with her. Like there's no way. So maybe, maybe that has something to do with it, ladies. Maybe. And like, do you imagine, I mean, I, in truth, this isn't that far from leaving cute little notes on your girl's car door or something like that, you know, leaving it in her bag uh, as she leaves for the day. So little things like that really do mean something uh, when you're in a, a relationship, whether early on or late. Eh, um, it means... Letting people know that you care. I mean, that's that's a big part of, you know, the, the good feeling of a relationship. That's just it. It means something when it's infrequent and meaningful. It's not just, yeah. you know, every day you leave a note, so every day you leave a note. It's kind of mm -hmm. like, you know... We were rushed out the door this morning and I forgot to kiss you goodnight or something. You know, something like that would it make a difference. Because, yeah, I mean, we. what you don't want, and, and it, it seems like it would be put on the same playing field, is, honey, pick up the eggs and at the store, and honey, you were amazing last night, I love you. <laughs> like, I, if they're presented in literally the exact same format... And in your chain of texts, they're right after one another. That devalues, to me, that little, you know, brief, really fantastic call out to your activity or your connection with that person. Because it, it's literally on the same playing field as, oh yeah, pick up some toilet paper. <laughs> How special is that? <laughs> like, and then what kind of a, what kind of relationship is built on non- physical face-to-face -face communication you're just you're just living on your phones it's it's as good or as bad as you want it to be in those two seconds until the next text rolls in it's weird i don't know i this does though seem to be a generational thing yeah it seems like the younger people are the more they text and i actually this boggles the mind but i actually know of parents who text their kids to tell them dinner's ready because <laughs> they're upstairs in their room. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I, 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 I just don't get that. I don't know. Maybe I'm just too old. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a thing where uh, when my son comes home from school, he texts me when he gets home. and says, okay, I'm home doing homework. And I'm like, okay, good. Just to make sure that he's there. But it's not like... Yeah, but I you're mean, not literally home. the yeah. other room. Yeah, I'm assuming <laughs> like, he's sending that to you. You're at work or you're in the car yeah. on the way home. <laughs> mm -hmm. Otherwise, he could just say, Dad, home. Yeah, and, and what is, I don't know, it's, it's weird. It, it makes me sort of fear this this future of, like, we just don't even need mouths anymore. As long as we have thumbs and technology, we are good to go. Well, I mean, it does go back to what they're saying where, you know, if the guys are kind of backing out of the relationship that the first way they would back out would be the face-to-face -face communication. If mm -hmm. your kids are starting to back out of the family, that's probably going to be a first thing they do too. And I do have to say, it's, it's easier for me to um, 
say things that are more, uh, not sexually, but personally intimate, it's easier to type them out for me than it is to say it face to face. But th there's something infinitely more powerful about staring into someone's eyes and saying something meaningful. I mean, it's, it's emotional. If I mean, I, I liken it to, um, saying my vows to my wife, uh, when we were getting married and I, I could not keep a dry eye because there was a passion that was being shared that, of course, that's an extreme. No one's going to text marry each other. But there's a passion in that emotional exchange of, I love you deeply. I want to share my life with you that you don't ever get. I mean, people complain about um, context uh, in emails and in social networking posts. And that's going to carry through to texting. You cannot communicate effectively as a human being if you're just doing... I mean, you can, you can say things. You can, you can communicate on the base level. But there's a lot of emotions that go into communication. There's body language, which if you're a Satanist, you pick up as lesser magic cues, which you would never get just by texting someone. And so if you want to be involved in this individual's life, for good or ill, you need to be face to face with them so you can pick up on those cues and then you can share your own. I mean, it's, it's an integral part of being a human being and, and we may be evolving away from it and I'm not going to be an old man to fight the whole way. Um, but just for me, I, you know, it's, there's, it has a role as all communication methods do. And it's definitely not a intimate one and it's not a sexual one in my opinion. I don't know for what it's worth. Uh, I definitely did want to bring that up just to mm -hmm. see if you had any context or um, experience and then to kind of deliver that. Um, do you want to jump to the next one? Sure. All right. Well, this is India Times, that hard hitting news outlet. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> post November 3rd. Brain can see in the dark. This is a study. At least 50%. <laughs> I love that they wrote out percent in the article. Um, instead of putting the percent sign. <laughs> At least 50% of people can see the movement of their own hand even when it's pitch black. A new study that used computerized eye trackers has found. Even in the absence of all light... The brain keeps track of the body, researchers, researchers said. Neuroscientists and psychologists, I can't even talk, discovered that the mind continues to perceive motion in complete darkness. Their findings suggest that 50%, again, per cent, not the percentage, of population sees in the dark without realizing it. Seeing in total darkness, according to the current understanding of natural vision, that doesn't just or just doesn't happen, says de Jutadin, a professor of brain and cognitive sciences at the University of Rochester who led the investigation. But this research shows that our own movements transmit sensory signals that also can create real visual perceptions in the brain, even in the complete absence of optical input, says Tadin. Through five separate experiments involving 129 individuals, the authors found that this eerie ability to see our hand in the dark suggests that our brain combines information from different senses to create our perceptions. The ability also underscores that we, what we normally perceive of as sight is really as much a function of our brain as our eyes said first author Kevin Dieter, a postdoctoral fellow in psychology at Vanderbilt University. For most people, this ability to see self-motion in darkness probably is learned, the authors conclude. Uh, Helen Keller, anyone? We get such reliable exposure to the sight of our own hand moving that our brains learn to predict the... I just stuck my foot in my mouth. Um, that our hand uh, moving that our brains learn to predict the expected moving image even without actual visual input, said Dieter. The study was published in Journal Psychological Science. Okay, so my question to you, Jesse. Mm -hmm. Um, If that last line is true, 
We get such reliable exposure to the sight of our hand moving that our brains learn to predict the expected moving image even without actual visual input. Then are we actually seeing it? I mean, is it if, if our brain is just anticipating it and putting, you know, in our mind's eye where it should be, then is it actually seeing it? In your opinion? I would say yes, it's actually seeing it because I think if you were to you know, wave your hand in front of your face and for some reason your hand fell off because <laughs> you're a zombie and not telling us that you would see that and it would interfere with your thoughts and you'd be like, oh shit, my hand just fell off. Um, but obviously this is showing that what we see in terms of what our, you know, what, what we're cognitive of seeing isn't just what we see. Yeah. And so there is the possibility that what we see, if you're getting two different inputs, whatever other input it is, one of them's your eyes, you get another set of inputs. If they don't agree, you know, if it's your hand falling off, I think you'll see your hand falling off. But if it's something else, maybe you won't know the difference. Maybe you'll go with the second source rather than the eyes. And I, I'm not even sure how you would begin to set that up and experiment with it and play with it and figure out how to use it. But yeah. it's very cool. I'm I, I wanted to bring this up because it, it's, it's very, t I mean, for me, the perception of our realities is an amazing thing. Um, you know, it, we, we see things in 2d, but our brain convinces us it's 3d. Uh, we only have access to a very limited spectrum uh spectrum of light uh and 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 so we we really are these rocks of experience just it all goes way past us we don't really understand anything but what we do understand we think is all real and un, all all truth and uh, you know all physical but even in absolute darkness when we cannot see our hand we our brain does its job and tells us that we do and we'll follow it as if it's really there, even though we don't have it. And I, I would imagine that this would be very similar to anyone who's blind, that if they've experienced sight at a point in their life, then they can imagine it as they're in drowned in darkness. And so they can visualize their world that they're walking through and that they're experiencing, even though they can't see it, they're able to maneuver it as if they could because they have that sensory input experience behind them. Um, I, I truly think this is amazing and it makes me sort of give those weird questions that I, I don't know about you but maybe in high school you did a couple drugs and you started asking yourselves like is this real? Why can I not put my hand through this desk? Like what is stopping me if we're just made up of molecules? What is actually stopping me from just having the molecules pass through molecules and and uh, the exploration of of science in its truest form of of the attempt to understand th our experience you know as, as human beings um articles like this sort of bring up that thought process there's this really fantastic experience i had in the military where we were doing night maneuvers and uh one of the sergeants i was with um, Sergeant Tierney, uh, I haven't thought of this guy in a long time. Um, he's actually like a Kirk Cameron type, mm. the actor, like a douchebag Christian fucking believer. But, um, he did give me this really good piece of advice. He said, uh, here's a secret. If you want to see anything at night, don't look at it, look around it. Um, if you look at it, then the light all around it is going to distort what you're actually looking at and you won't be able to focus. But if you're looking around it, then you're using that light to define it rather than obscure it. And it's not scientific and it's not, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not this proven fact of experience, but for me, it's always worked and it, it's a way of tricking your eye. Like if you want to see something in the dark, don't look at it. it it's counterintuitive, but it works every single time. Um, I was, I went camping with my nephew and his wife and my wife and we went up to the hot springs and we were rushing to drop off my kids at the grandparents and then uh, hurry up and drive up into the Uintas and then park the car and then hike up 
um, in pure darkness, set up the tent and then hike up further. Uh, and it was so dark that you couldn't see anything. And there, there are parts where you do have a significant 35 foot drop from this edge of the trail if you're not paying attention. And the only way you can actually see the rocks and see the trail and see the trees is if you don't look at them. It's weird, but it works. And I don't understand it, but it works. And so this this article sort of brought that funny experience up and I wanted to share that and just sort of revel in the nerdity. Is that a word? In the nerdism of science. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, perception and experience. It's really cool. Do you have any uh, any insight there? Uh, the only experience that was coming to mind when you were talking about that, I was snowmobiling one time on a reservoir. And, wow. you know, so kind of big, open, flat space. And it had recently snowed like a light, fine powder. And the wind blew up. And so it blew up all the powder all around me. And so it's like I'm cruising along at, say, 50 miles an hour. And all of a sudden, <sighs> it's just white everywhere can't see a thing and it i mean there wasn't any i wasn't like i was following somebody and there was somebody beside me but we weren't like near each other so it wasn't like i was going to crash into anything or anything but i just went into this instant panic like (laughs) heart pounding in my throat kind of panic and and you know the breeze blew up the the dust and then the breeze blew the dust away and it only lasted a second but it was just like Oh my God, the world is gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like a sensory. Uh, yeah, totally. And, uh, tank or something. You know, and of course, snowmobiling, you can't hear anything because you just got the dull roar of the motor going. So it was, it was instantly I had nothing to kind of, you know, except the memory of what had been there a couple seconds earlier. Dang. It was just weird. Very, very weird. That's cool. Yeah. Wow. Well, um, how about we transition to something not so weird and a little bit exciting with the old Nick Peep Show? All right. Welcome to another Old Nick Peep Show. I'm very excited. The second episode of this series, and once again, I'm being joined by Witch Marilyn Mansfield and Warlock Zothamog. How are you two? Hello. Hi, Adam. We're doing well. Fantastic. I'm really excited to hear from you guys again, especially with the new issue out. Yes, it was just released, the hot and horny Halloween issue, volume (laughs) three, number three. It's out now. I always, I'm just, I'm retarded, I think, but I always get those volume and issues mixed up. Like yeah, volume there's, and numbers. Yeah, there's, um, there's four issues to every volume because it comes out quarterly. So, you know, this is the third for the third volume. Sweet. Well, I actually picked it up because I'm obsessive like that and uh, I've already <laughs> gone through it a number of times and it is fantastic. Thank you. Uh, did you guys want to uh, talk about it at all? Uh, like what, what is included in this issue? Um, yeah, sure. There's there's tons of um, articles and, of course, the wonderful women that are in it. Uh, yeah, our centerfold, uh, Marlena D. She has a nice um, spread of Halloween-themed, witch-themed, you know. There's also yeah. um, very nice girls, um, Alexis. There's a, it's a blonde petite. There's Dahlia, who's like a pinup. Um, We also have Raven, who does, like, a nice uh, photo shoot with her fishnet stockings for those people in there into, like, the fruit fetish or the stocking fetish thing. Nylons. Nylons, yes. Nylons. Misty is a nice uh, chocolate-skinned girl with curly hair. Very nice. And, of course, uh, Selena Minx does her her issue, um, what should we call it, her article for um, the magic, the sex magic. Putting yeah. seance and sex magic. We also have a nice article by uh, Gavin Badley, who does uh, The Devil's Got Your Goat. That's a great article there. There's, um, you know, Wine, Women, and Song, which is uh, has some of my music reviews in it. There talks about the updates to the COS website or, and some reviews of some artwork. Um, geez, I could go on and on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there, there's a couple that, that really stood out to me. I mean, I, 
I, I kind of, uh, I, I thought this issue in particular really struck with me on the women's side of things. Um, first the, the, I, it was Misty was the, the black girl. Yeah. Fucking gorgeous. Like, oh I, yeah, she really is. She's really beautiful. Unbelievable. She, it took me back to like 1970s pin, like black <laughs> pinup and it was fantastic. I, I really, really dig that. Um, and then there was this, uh, you gotta, excuse me, the blonde girl with the super black makeup around her eyes. Yeah. It's Alexis. Alexis really mm-hmm. struck a chord with me. I thought that was fantastic, but there was this really great article in here and I, I hope I'm not stealing any thunder here and I, I won't go too much in depth because really listeners, you should be picking it up yourself. If you don't already have the, um, print issue uh obviously it just came out so it probably didn't come in the mail you can actually get the digital issue free if you buy the print issue right but there's this really great article the the vices segment gentlemen's club etiquette yes yes i wish <laughs> i wish i would have read that before i went the first time <laughs> to <a> club. <laughs> <laughs> totally embarrassing. I I definitely was one of those guys that went to the front row all excited and then didn't have any cash to back it up. So it would have been nice to read that article. I definitely <laughs> recommend anyone interested in clubs to, to read that first. <laughs> yes. As, as always, there's always great articles in old Nick besides the wonderful women that are in there. And uh, yeah. the gentleman's etiquette is uh, definitely one of the good ones. <laughs> We we actually had um we did um Chilla Theater, which is a horror expo. I was selling the dolls there, um uh what was it, two weeks ago now? Yeah. And um actually Adam Cardone um showed up with um Marlena D and she is just so sweet and so adorable, you know, and um it was nice. It was really nice to meet her and then see her on, you know, um in the magazine. So that was is it- uh, I mean, you you have modeling experience, so this mm-hmm. this may not be such a big deal for you. But meeting meeting a model after you've seen them uh, striking the pose and and really being very forthcoming with their body, do you build up an expectation about what they're going to be like in person? And then when you meet them, it's just in stark contrast, completely different. I mean, for me, I don't really I don't really see. Um... You know, because I model too, so I don't really yeah. see it like that for me. But um, people have, you know, come over to me and and been like, "Oh my god, I can't believe like I'm meeting you," you know. And it's and I'm just and they're always like, "Oh, you look, you know, you look just as pretty in person or prettier or whatever." And I'm like, "Oh, okay, thank you," because <laughs> that's always good. I try not to like Photoshop my my pictures and all that, you know. So yeah, um, I mean. No, it's just to me, it's like it's nice to meet you in person, that kind of thing. You know, I mean, I don't know. I'm sure other people get like, um, you know, um, really, really excited. You know, I mean, especially men when they see a woman in, in a, you know, uh, half naked in a magazine and they get to meet them. I'm sure it's thrilling. Uh, but for me, I'm like, wow, she seems really, you know, really sweet. I hope to meet her. And then they showed up at Chiller and I was like, hey, great to meet you, you know. And, um, you know, we were just hanging out a little bit, but yeah, she's is really it, great. And I really like the cover. I think it's great. I love the whole witch theme and, you know, yeah. of course, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it does speak to a, a, certainly a certain segment of this audience. Um, but l- largely, you know, to the, the, the audience that old Nick caters to, I think. Um, so it's always nice to see that, uh, indulgence, um, yeah. And maybe, maybe this is directed more to you, Zoth. Um, is it strange? Was there any hurdles you had to go over? Because Marilyn really was like the first old Nick chick. I believe we mentioned in the last uh, time we spoke. Yeah. So is, is it strange sharing, um, that, that connection, even though it's just visual, um, that at one point was really just for you. Is it strange sharing that with other people, with her uh, modeling in the magazine? Oh, no, no, not at all. Not Well, not for me. I don't know. I'm, I can't speak for all men out there, but I'm right. not, you know, the, the jealous type. I actually feel very proud, you know, of Marilyn whenever she does modeling work and when people admire her. Um, it, it, it makes me feel good, you know. I, I don't see it in any way as a negative thing. I've actually, you know, grown to love that kind of thing. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful. That's great. 
I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything that, you know, obviously my husband was uncomfortable with, but Mm -hmm. he's, he's like, so, you know, he's very open-minded and he, he, you know, loves anything I do. So, I mean, he's always there with the shoots too. And he comes up with some crazy ideas that I'm not, I don't want to do. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, you know, he doesn't care at all. Believe me. He's like not the jealous type. He's like my number one, you know, uh, fan over there cheering me on to like, you know, he, he always thinks I wear too much clothes and things, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you could imagine a photo shoot, it would it would be her doing what she's doing. And I'm kind of in the background like, OK, yeah, now take it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. he, he's like, yeah, he's he does not mind at all. No, no I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's just me, you know. I'm very comfortable yeah. with nudity, and I'm, uh, you know, I love the the female body. So I'm I'm not, you know, like one of these like uptight kind of individuals or the jealous type. Yeah. I mean, we've been together for a million years too. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Plus, I mean, that's one of the reasons why why you know we've been together so long is because we both support each other, and you know he's not like that, and I'm able to be, you know, who I really am, and you know, express myself in any way I. I see that you know well that suits me and he's very supportive which is really great and very important in you know a um marriage partnership whatever you know yeah yeah absolutely. and you know as for old nick i think the the taste of, of the photography there is it's something that i approve of i wouldn't want her to do something well i would i wouldn't feel comfortable with her doing something that was that was like really like hardcore pornographic i think so long as there's a good taste to it i'm okay with it that's great well what about um you know other potential models for example uh is there any any advice uh marilyn maybe that you would have if if they're interested in becoming a model for old nick right like what would they need to do right um well old nick is always looking for new models you know once again it's you have to submit photos um you know, there is nudity requ- required, so you have to be comfortable with, um, you know, nudity. Um, you know, the thing I would say is if you're not totally comfortable with nudity and, you know, that kind of modeling work, then, you know, um, then it's probably not for you. But there are <laughs> yeah. many women like, you know, I, to me, I don't see I don't see anything wrong with nudity, but that's just me. I understand, you know, girls who who don't feel comfortable getting nude. That's fine. But, you know, there are a lot of um, models that 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 don't mind and enjoy doing nude shoots or what have you. And we are always looking for new models. Um, You know, the best thing to do would be to um, submit your information and um, your photos to info at oldnickmagazine.com. Now, you know, age of proof of age and all that will be required. So, you know, everything mm-hmm. is on the up and up. So, you know, just no you know, early Tracy Lords. Yeah, in. everything is completely legit. And, you know, um, of course, 18 and over. <laughs> yeah. um, but I mean, you know, it is it is a great, great magazine to showcase, um, you know, uh, you know, your your photos and um, sometimes Bob will uh, maybe have a model like if the shoot idea will be his. And, you know, um, like with my Jane shoot, I mean, my first shoot that I did for old Nick, that was like a 10 hour shoot I did. Jeez. And, yeah, I, I mean, it was like it was planned. I planned it out for, I think, a month, you know, and I, you know, I um, had a really good photographer and we planned out the location, everything. And, you know, I got all different props and things. And I mean, it was literally 10 hours, 10 hours. I was in front. I mean, there are thousands of pictures from that shoot. Wow. Half of it, there was a real um, fireplace going. So I was like melting. <laughs> <laughs> but the pictures came out fantastic, you know, and um Bob was very pleased, you know, and then with the Jane shoot, I did it at my house because I like to do, I like to do personal, um, shoots in my house because I think it gives a a feeling of, you know, more of me, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like with my things around and, 
you know, just I, I just always feel that it, it's, it works out better because it's given you kind of a glimpse into, you know, my life and, you know, taking nice pictures as well. So. Right. But, um, you know, so I mean, but, you know, as you know, Old Nick um, showcases many different um, looking women. So there really is no, you know, you know, um, strict guidelines. So. You know, if anyone's interested, I, I mean, it was great for me. And I, it was a great addition to my portfolio. You know, um, I was always very proud uh, of my work with Old Nick. And I still am. And I always will be, you know. So, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people, you know, um, really enjoyed the pictures and had me sign their copies and things like that. And it's a great experience. You know, so that's all like, you know, for me, it was a great experience. And, and a few of the models that I know that have modeled for old Nick, it's been a great experience for them as well. You know, and it can open up doors for you. You never know, you know? Yeah. So, so it's info at old Nick com If you're interested and you know, good luck. I, I do want to ask one thing because it, it seems to be maybe a potential hurdle for some women to get through. Um, and I even have a, a kind of a, a weird anecdotal story to go along with it, but I, I would imagine finding the right photographer would be challenging. So, um, for example, when I was uh, just out of high school, uh, a bunch of buddies of mine were thinking about going uh, and trying out to, uh, for, to be like in a porn movie. And there was this local photographer that worked fr like remotely from Vegas. He would fly up to Salt Lake and meet with people. And a couple of my buddies already went in to go get their photos taken and to make sure that they were the right type for the videos that were being shot that um, particular week. And uh, I was like third in line. And so the, the two went ahead of me and I started hearing these stories filtering back. And what, what the photographer would do was drug them, pay them $5 to go down on them, take some pictures, and that would be that. Like it had nothing to do with porn at all. Like, oh boy, <laughs> the industry. He was just using that as a front to sort of take advantage of these young men. Um, and so I immediately just like you know 180. I don't want anything to do with this. Never mind. I I changed my mind uh, after hearing that. And I imagine it would be the same thing with some women. A little bit of trepidation, not really knowing the photographers. So is this something where Old Nick could recommend photographers? Or how 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 do you, as a potential model, you want high-quality photos, but you don't want to get taken advantage of? Do you have any right. advice in that arena? Well, that that's, you know, that's just an, an ongoing, um, you know, thing with with girls, aspiring models, models, you know, um, that are working with independent, you know, um, artists, people, photographers or whatever. I mean, I know dozens of photographers and over the years, you know, um, I, I've, I've worked with people that, you know, they, I mean, anyone will basically, a lot of them will try and get girls naked for free, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and <laughs> I was never, you know, I, to be honest with you, the only uh, topless pictures of me are in Old Nick. That's where, you know, I ever, that's the only place I've ever done, like, topless pictures, except for the Penthouse article that Bob Johnson had written. That was mm -hmm. my first topless, um, you know, modeling uh, exposure, you know. Um, but, you know, with, with especially younger girls, you have to be very careful because – you know, like I said, they, you can get taken advantage of, you know, um, you don't know who you're meeting up with. I mean, there are things like model mayhem and things where people just, you know, meet up and it might just be some guy with a camera who's not even like really a photographer, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, and I've dealt with a couple of them that they were interested in, you know, and then like it, it turned out to be really weird. So I didn't even, you know, go or whatever, but what I could recommend is, you know, either you find someone that, you know, worked with someone you know or has a good reputation, or there have been times where there have been models um, that were interested in posing for Old Nick, and I actually helped them find a photographer in right. the area. Um, Bob Bob has set up um, 
shoots for models with photographers that he knows based on, you know, location and things like that. So there is, I mean, if there's a potential model that has great photos and she really doesn't know who, you know, um, a photographer that's really good, I always have someone, you know, especially in the New York City area that I can recommend. Yeah. You know, but you have to be careful with anything. I mean, that's, it's not only photographers. It's, it's like what you said, you know, going on auditions for things. You know, you just have to always be careful, especially this day and age. So, you know, All right. but I definitely if they if if they're interested and they write to me, I know dozens of photographers, you know, and I can help recommend one, you know, um, that would be willing to work with, you know, um, the girl and have their pictures um, published in the magazine, Great. including the ones that um, shot for me for the magazine. So, yeah. Mm hmm. Well, that's fantastic. Um, again, congratulations on the release of the issue because it is a fantastic one. Um, I, I really dug it in a lot of different ways. So thank you for that. And you know what? I, I'm really looking forward to the next time we can talk and seeing what's on the horizon. Yes. All right. Thank you for having <laughs> us. We love being on the show. Thank you. Uh, well, until next month, hail Satan. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. And that is going to do it for another show. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, you know what we forgot, Jesse? What did we forget? We forgot to say how people could find out a little bit about you. Ah, well, I am on Twitter at, uh, at Damn Lucky. And I have a blog, which is, is drafts from a satanic windbag.wordpress.com. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> All right. That's a very short, succinct <laughs> title for the blog. Suggestions for a new name are welcome. <laughs> At damn lucky Porn on and kittens. <laughs> <laughs> um, I definitely recommend everyone go check out Jesse on Twitter and on her blog. Obviously, it'll be in the show notes, and then you can check out 9centspodcast.com. There'll be links there that you can uh, get to her blog, too. But if there are segments of, or I'm sorry, if there are episodes of her segment that you uh, maybe want to see the transcript of, some of those exist on that blog. So that is your one-stop shopping way of <laughs> seeing uh, all of her content without me talking over it. So I, I highly recommend it. No, I, I think you're a fantastic contributor. I think you are uh, a valuable voice in the greater satanic conversation. And I think everyone should be hearing what you have to say. And so the blog is just another <laughs> way of uh, experiencing that. Oh, the word blog. Um, all right, everyone, I would love to hear from you. And I'm pretty damn sure Jesse would too. I would. In fact, what? I said I would. Yeah. I think every contributor would like to hear from you. So... Let them hear from you. Visit the website 9centspodcast.com and send your correspondence to info at 9centspodcast.com. Let me know of any suggestions, critiques, corrections, or general comments you might have. And I have to make a, a little note. I got correspondence from a listener who's been listening for years who had never communicated with me before. And he had this really fantastic... I mean, he had some really great suggestions for the show, which I truly appreciate. Um, but he said, listening to the show every week, in a weird way... Was like checking in with an old friend. Uh, that's fantastic. I, I mean, that that sort of made me feel really good. Obviously, it's one sided because I don't know you people, but <laughs> I mean that you know if you're tuning in because you want you know as if I was a friend of yours, like you want to hear what I have to say, you want to see what's going on. I mean that that tells me that I'm doing the right thing, that I'm 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 making something of value, and my contributors, uh, those who are contributing to the show, are are doing something wonderful and and we are truly defining the satanic conversation and i think that's that's amazing so thank you for that correspondence um again four nine cents you can visit the face i'm sorry uh, satanet facebook google plus twitter or myspace page and get updated on weekly topics download the show monday nights via my rss feed found at nine cents podcast.com we're also on last fm stitcher spotify and youtube so look for us there you can subscribe to Nine Cents via iTunes by searching Nine Cents, and don't forget to leave a rating and or comment. 
If you'd like to learn more about the Church of Satan or to visit and see the new facelift, visit churchofsatan.com. And remember that the only way that this podcast is going to continue, the only way that the contributors, these amazing people who are taking time out of their regular lives to bring you content, is going to continue, is if you tell someone, is if you share this podcast, is if you tell them that what they are doing is of value. Let them know. Spread the word. And let's keep this podcast going. Once again, thank you for joining me. And as always, I'm your host, Adam Campbell, being joined by... Jesse. Until next week, hail Satan. Hail Satan.